Good morning, one and all. Welcome to the third session of this season's Breakfast Club. Um, I'm Carol Kane, columnist at the Detroit Free Press, producer host of CBS Detroit's Michigan Matters, and it's such an honor to be with you today. Um, I'm also glad to see all of you because I half wondered if folks were sitting over at the Townsend waiting for us. Uh, some of you told me they were there saying, wait a minute, this is a really light crowd over there. <laughs> Anyways, it's great to have you here. Um, and for those of you watching via live stream, hello from the beautiful Daxton Hotel here in Birmingham. It's great to have you with us. The Free Press launched this speaker series in 2018 with the mission of putting attention on important issues beyond just our region, state, nation, and international. That focus continued this post-pandemic session as well, when our first event featured Jennifer Granholm, who kicked things off with a uh, passionate and informative discussion about the future of energy. In November, we had billionaire entrepreneur Dan Gilbert, who took to the stage for the first time since facing personal challenges, as he talked about his hometown and helping to entice and bring along more young talent, young companies, a theme that I'm gonna guess probably 99% of the folks in this room also have. Today, we continue our series featuring major headliners and newsmaker with a person just incredibly tied to Detroit as few others. Uh, it's a distinct honor and personal privilege that Bill Ford agreed to visit with us in this conversation that I, I know we're all looking forward to. Um, he grew up in the auto industry. The Motor City isn't just his hometown, it's part of his DNA. And as executive chair of Ford, he's impacted not only our largest industry, but the region. He's also a champion of entrepreneurs as well as a philanthropist who, with his wife, Lisa, are also involved in helping entrepreneurs and young people here in Detroit. We're gonna hear about that more in the conversation. Um, but not surprisingly, from my standpoint, the free press's standpoint, that when we reached out to you in this room about this event, it instantly sold out. So for those of you here, thank you, thank you, thank you. Your support means more than you could possibly know. Now I'd like to bring up an editor that everybody here knows, Nicole Avery Nichols, esteemed editor of the Free Press, to say a few words. Thank you, Carol. Thank you, Carol. Thank you, everyone, and good morning. As you know, my name is Nicole Avery Nichols. I am the editor of the Free Press and the vice president of the Free Press as well. It is my pleasure to welcome all of you to this new location to our breakfast club. We want to thank Bill Ford, the executive chair of Ford Motor Company, for joining us in conversation today. Ford has been such an integral part of the history of Detroit, of the history of our country, and globally as well. So as we think about what comes next for automotive, for vehicles, for manufacturing, this is such a well-timed conversation, and we are looking forward to it. Thank you for the support, Mr. Ford. So I wanted to talk to you all briefly about history today. My reference point was going to be the movie News of the World, starring Tom Hanks. Does anybody know this movie? In that film, Tom Hanks travels from American City. It's a um, post-Civil War movie. In a wagon, he travels from city to city to city, and he hosts newspaper readings for clamoring audiences for 10 cents apiece. Some of the news is outdated, even months old, but people stand in line because they're very interested in being informed and sometimes entertained because he does embellish in those stories. So I was going to talk to you about that and I was going to say, look how far we've come. But then in the uh, VIP area, in the reception area, my friend Linda Solomon handed me this. It's a 1937 Free Press. I know, right? <laughs> um, can't wait to dig into it. Three cents per copy. And on the top of it, it says, on guard for over a century. Yeah. <laughs> so 
It's just a reminder that the Detroit Free Press has been on guard and serving information needs in Metro Detroit and Michigan at large for 192 years. And now we do it in print, in podcast, at freep.com, in film festivals. We're in conversation today. We appreciate all of your support to keep the legacy going. I know all of, the, all of you are subscribers in this room, but when you leave this room, please tap another person that's not a subscriber. It's only a dollar for six months. We appreciate the support and we will continue to be on guard. Thank you all. Thanks for coming. And speaking of the internet, I remember being at a managing editor's association gathering of Big papers across the country, New York, it was 1992. We had sessions on different things. They had one all about the internet. We all looked at each other and said, oh, next one, please, thinking it's not gonna be anything. We were wrong, so don't look to journalists to make predictions on stuff necessarily. Anyone who puts on these kinds of events knows you need a special group to make it happen. Uh, we're blessed to have an all-star team with the Michigan.com partners. So Aaron Veltoven, Amy Rosner, Marcy Vaselli, Marianne Toma, and Kristen Orr, if you could stand, be acknowledged. Yes. Thanks for all your hard work in making today's event happen. And we also thanks the Daxton for their hospitality. We want to give a shout out to all the Breakfast Club sponsors who make this possible. I'm going to ask you to hold your applause if you can until we're done with all of them. Presenting sponsors, PNC Bank, Henry Ford Health. Diamond sponsor, DTE Energy. Gold sponsors, PVS Chemicals and Ford. Silver sponsors, AAA and Cure Auto Insurance. Wonder how that happened. Bronze sponsor, Visit Detroit. Detroit Auto Dealers Association. Downtown Detroit Partnership. Oakland University, Blue Cross Blue Shield, Lawrence Tech. Dunamis Charged, Detroit Regional Partnership. Uh, Delta Dental. Detroit Pistons, Hollywood Casino, Mish Auto, Detroit Regional Chamber, and the table sponsors, Michigan Manufacturers Association, HNTB, and BNR Consultants. Now, hearty applause, please. We also are blessed to have with us some young people of the future. We have some students from Pershing High School out here. You can stand to be recognized out here. And it's because of the generosity of PBS Chemicals and Detroit Auto Dealers that they're here. And again, I, I can't say enough about how much all of you being here means. And, and as we tackle these important subjects, I know that's a big part of this, is having speakers who know so much about various things, but at their heart, Detroit, our region, and helping Michigan here. So um, we're going to start this. Um, Bill Ford, really, what can I say about Bill Ford that uh, <laughs> hasn't been written about over in the media, whatever here? He has been a, a environmentalist. He has been a champion of Detroit. He has, he and his wife Lisa continue to give back through philanthropy. He champions this, this train station, which we're gonna talk about too here. He's done so many, so many things here to help our region. He also is a leader who cares about the company. He's the great grandson of the founder. And there's so much more I know you're all going to want to hear from him, so. Without further ado, I'd like to invite uh, Bill Ford. Come on up. How you doing? Appreciate that. Okay, the stairs that way. Okay. Making sure you know where the stairs are in the event. You don't like the questions, you can dash for it. <laughs> Well, I, think, I always like to give you an out. I've done enough interviews with you, Carol. I think I know where the exit is. And I'll be good. Let's be good. Thank you. We have been, last time I talked to you, we were in the train station, in fact, it was two years ago. And I remember the ceiling tiles, which had been impeccably fixed, took 18 months to just do those tiles. And I thought this is, this is going to be done in about 150 years. So okay, congratulations to you. But before we get to that, let me start with an investment, let's talk not just about your investments in that and the company, but something else that is incredibly important taking place today. 
and some of you around the room have asked me what these little lapel pins are about. It's the 60th anniversary of the debut of the Mustang today. An incredible, an incredible vehicle, the pony vehicle. I mean, my God, generations have driven it. It just, all the, the, the Me Too cars that came after it have all fallen by the wayside. I'm going to imagine there's a generation of young people born in those cars, or conceived in those cars at least. I don't know, but it's, that car has captivated the country's attention. Hence, my very long question is, what's the Mustang meant to you, and why is it still popular still? Well, I, I, first I've heard people were born in the back seats of Mustangs. That's, uh, anyway, Mustang back seats weren't made for a lot of fun things. But anyway, um, the, the, uh, no, the, the Mustang uh, is, is incredible. I mean, it's been in over 5,000 movies. Um, it's, I know I'm not supposed to say this, but it's my all-time favorite car. Um, I, I own too many of them. And, um, but, you know, in fact, I'm going on uh, tomorrow. Uh, I'm taking one of my favorite Mustangs to Jay Leno's garage, uh, and I'm going to, he's, because he's all fired up about the, the 60th anniversary of the Mustang. So that should be fun, and I'm going to let Jay drive through the streets of uh, uh, LA, and I'll be his passenger. We'll be talking about the Mustang. But, um, you know, it, it's a, one of the things that really stuck with me was about 10 years ago, we introduced uh, Mustang to uh, the Middle East. And as part of this, they did this stunt, which I still can't believe they did. The world's tallest building is called the Burj Khalifa, and they had a Mustang on the top of the Burj Khalifa. Um, and uh, what was really interesting, and so I went and we gave a little talk. But as I was talking, I saw all these people decked out in Mustang gear, just from head to foot. And I thought, well, who are these people? So uh, as soon as my little thing ended, I went over to them and I said, you know, um, obviously you're Mustang enthusiasts, but like, wh where are you from? It was really interesting. They were all from different countries, uh, none of which had Mustangs, but they were the Mustang club of those countries. <laughs> and uh, it, was really, it was really amazing. And that really, not that I needed reinforcement, but it really showed me the power of the brand. And, yeah, I mean, it's just been fun for generations since 1964, and, and people have loved that car. And, um, and I think part of it, too, is it's, it's accessible. Um, you know, it's not a supercar that's going to cost you a fortune that you're afraid to drive and afraid to park somewhere. Uh, I mean, they're meant to be driven. They're meant to have fun. Um, and I, I, you, know, you can tell, I could go on all day about Mustang. I love them. Do you know which Mustang you're taking over to see? Do you hang out with Jay? Yeah, I do, obviously. Uh, so, uh, so uh, yeah, the, I have the uh, 1964 Indy Pace Car Mustang, which was the first time that Mustang had been shown publicly. And, uh, but it wasn't fast enough. So I had to, it, I didn't, but it was uh, modified uh, by a race shop that's still around Holman Moody in North Carolina. They modified <laughs> the engine. And it's very cool because it's still got all the decals on it. It has the flags in the back. It still has the, the walkie-talkies in it. Um, and actually, the really fun part, it was driven by my uncle, Benson Ford, um, oh. at the race. So yeah, I, that, I, I could have chosen any number of them, but I thought that would be a fun one for to him to see. That's, yeah. that's cool. So a little birdie told me. OK, I'll tell you, it was your wife, Lisa, who told me um, that you set don't out. Don't believe it. Whatever it is, <laughs> just don't believe it. That you set out in, we're talking circa 2018, 17, in that time frame. There was, you wanted to undertake a project, something that would be restorative, something that would reinvent. And you came back and decided on the Michigan train station as the project to put your imprint on. Um, I mean, an incredible, incredible undertaking. Um, why that building and what's this project bringing it to life, which is going to culminate June 6th, for those of you in the room who may not know, when it officially opens for everybody. Yeah, it's going to be really fun, and I hope you all can come. It's going to be awesome. We're going to have a great event. Um, I won't say more about it. It's just going to be really, really wonderful. And a lot of talent that was originally from Michigan, some of them are still here, are all going to perform. Uh, it's just going to be a fun, fun night. But actually, you got to go back way before 2018 to 2005. And I joined the board of eBay then, <clears throat> and it was in Silicon Valley. And I, therefore, would go out to Silicon Valley every month. And uh, on the board were a lot of uh, the most important venture capitalists in Silicon Valley. And it became very clear to me very quickly that 
the future was not being invented in Detroit. It was being invented elsewhere. And that really bothered me. And I would ask at every meeting that I was out there uh, to these venture capitalists, take me to something interesting uh, that I might otherwise wouldn't know about. And some of them had tremendous application to our industry, none of which was you know, anyone in Michigan was awake to at the time, some of which had nothing to do with our industry. But it was all sort of culminating in the fact that the best and the brightest and all the money and all the you know, intensity was flowing there and it wasn't coming here. Interestingly, uh, one of those early meetings, I went to a young company called Tesla. Uh, and people think that Elon Musk founded it. He didn't. He actually wasn't the, even the CEO then. It was a guy named Martin Eberhardt. And, um, and so I went and met with Martin. And they were just, you know, all they had was this kind of um, very crude, Lotus-based uh, sports car that shake, rattled, and rolled, had no fit and finish. But wow, was it interesting. And uh, I couldn't get anybody, I mean anybody, uh, at my own company to show even an ounce of interest in this. So, um, and when I brought, bring it up, they'd all kind of laugh and say, oh, are you kidding? Those things will never, I mean. And, and, and that was sort of true of everything that I was seeing out there. <clears throat> so I gave a speech in 2011, a TED Talk, about how our industry was going to change and that people uh, in our industry were not at the forefront of that change. And it, it was either going to happen with us or it was going to happen without us. Uh, but it was inexorably, it was going to happen. And so um, I started a venture capital fund uh, a few years later uh, to invest in the future of mobility. And guess what? None of the investments were in Michigan. Um, and that really bothered me, too. I mean, I liked the investments we were making, but it really was alarming that nothing was happening here. So. It's a long way of answering your question. <laughs> when we got to 2018, uh, Mary Culler, who's here today, and I were talking, uh, and, and uh, you know, and we started talking about the train station as we were, you know, what if, what if? And it, it, it struck me that if all we did to it was just an amazing restoration and made it wonderful for the public, that would be great. But it had to be something more. It had to be the place where the future of transportation was reinvented one more time, and that the Motor City became the Motor City again. And so um, we're, we're in a war for talent. Michigan is, our industry is, Ford is. And part of that is giving people amazing uh, problems to solve and also amazing places to work. Because it's hard to attract people from the East Coast, and it's even harder to attract people from the West Coast. Um, and so if you give them some nondescript building in, a, in the suburbs to work in, that's a tough sell. Um, and we need the best and the brightest. Any company is only as good as its people. So um, we then bought the train station. We bought what's next door, the book depository building. That's up and running. We have 92 startups in there today. And they've raised almost $700 million in funding. We have 20 venture capital firms in there today. Um, Half of those companies are from Michigan, which is wonderful, mm -hmm. but, even, but half are not, which is great too, because they want to stay here. And we need to not just grow our own, we need to attract people from outside. So, uh, and then, okay, so then what will happen with the train station? So it'll be bigger companies working in the tra train sta uh, station, hand in hand with these startups. Companies like Google will be there. Um, you know, obviously Ford will be there. Uh, and this is an open platform. We want everyone to come. We don't want this to be a Ford thing. We want the best and the brightest. It could be, and actually at the Book Depository building, Stellantis and GM are working with a lot of those companies that we're not working with, um, which is awesome. That's exactly what I wanted to see happen. Mm -hmm. So um, the train station is going to be wonderful for the community. The first floor is going to, you're going to walk in, your jaw will drop. The restoration, I'm so proud of the work that was done. It's, it's, and people get all choked up, uh, Carol, when they come in. And they get choked up for two different reasons. People my age and older get choked up because that was their Ellis Island. Um, and this is where people took their first step in Detroit, often coming from the south, coming from wherever they came <coughs> from, this was it. People younger, all they ever knew was to, it to be a horrible blight on the city. And they walk in, and they get choked up because they see you know, what was once just you know, 
the, the, actually, the, often the photograph that was shown as the decay of Detroit now is going to be you know, the beacon of the future of Detroit. So they get choked up. And we're going to have lots of fun on that first floor. It's going to be you know, uh, restaurants and bars and, and uh, retail, music, art. Um, we have Roosevelt Park out front, which is just, you know, the city has done an amazing job of getting that back together and ready to go. We have the, the Greenway behind us, which we're now connected to, uh, so that anybody working there can go play in the Greenway and go wherever they like. So it's going to be awesome. And I'll stop here because I could obviously go on and on and on. Uh, but I think people are going to love it, and, you, and they'll love it for different reasons. That's, a, that's, that's it. That's it? Yeah, that's it. <laughs> you took my breath away there for a second. Yes. You're obviously very passionate about this. This is wonderful. Um, something else, you and Lisa, your wife, who is here, by the way. Yes, she is. Um, and so is my daughter, Alexandra. And your daughter, Alexandra, who is yeah, a board member at Ford. The family's yes, she's all a board here. Member Ford. Here Let me tell you the problem with having your daughter as a board member. Uh-oh. <laughs> Do tell. You find out everything you're doing wrong. Uh, <laughs> a lot of people won't tell you. She can't wait to tell me. <laughs> <It's> a... <laughs> and think of it. This, could, this is actually a good thing. Yeah, well, yes. It's, it's I don't know, exhausting. Alexandra, is this a good thing? <laughs> <laughs> so you and Lisa, who have various philanthropic things that you're doing, you decided to launch the Michigan Central Station Children's Endowment Campaign along with the Children Foundation. I know Andrew Stein is over here as well yep. with that. You're trying to raise $10 million for 10 children's organizations, mm -hmm. smaller, maybe even start closer to startups, to help them get seed money. And, and why is that so important to you guys? Well, first of all, uh, it's all Lisa. Uh, and she's working her, her tail off to get this done with Andrew, who's amazing. Um, and what we realized, and, and you know, what Lisa realized, because this wasn't me, was that our, compared to any other city in America, Detroit's children's uh, charities don't have foundations. Um, you know, hospitals do, universities do mm -hmm. here, but a lot of our smaller organizations really live year to year, hand, you know, and, and you know, hand to mouth in some respects. And so we wanted to see if we could take some of the pressure off of them. Uh, and so, uh, and Andrew um, has been amazing, and he will collect what we raise. Um, and he will, he and uh, this other panel, won't be Lisa and I, will choose um, the 10 chair recipients. And then we're going to give 500,000 initially to, when I say we, Andrew is, uh, to the children's, uh, they'll raise another 500,000. And when they do that, we'll give them another 500. So basically they'll have a 1.5 million, uh, we hope, uh, uh, endowment by the time this is all finished, which will you know, help take some of the, because a lot of what is, you, all, you all are involved with so many things here in this room. But a lot of the things that they try and ask donors for money for aren't very sexy, right? Uh, but they need to be done. And so it's hard to raise money against those things. And so that's, that's what this will do. And so we're, you know, it's a short fuse. We're trying to get it all done by the opening of the train station on, on June 6th. Um, Andrew has seen a lot more of Lisa than I have, I think, the last few, few uh, months because uh, they're, they're working day and night to get this done. But we, we thought it would, you know, let's use this opening of a great thing and do something really cool with it uh, that will benefit the kids of, of, of our area. So that, that's what that is, and I'm uh, really excited by it. And, and by the way, the support that people have, have given has just been great. Mm -hmm. um, it's, I'm, I'm very excited. And a lot of good things going forward coming out of that, too. About, oh gosh, two or three years ago now, um, EV euphoria was everywhere. Analysts were going rah rah. Companies, Ford, GM, others, battery makers, everything was going crazy. This was the future. But sales are not what a lot of people thought they would be at this point. Um, are you disappointed EV sales are not what they should be? No, we, we made the bet uh, several years ago. Look, I've been around this industry long enough to know that nothing happens as you plan, right? And so we decided that we were going to continue to invest in our, uh, what we call our ICE products, our internal combustion engine products. Um, but they had to be special. So there are things like you know, Bronco, Mustang, Raptor, really cool products that uh, people are going to want regardless of what is propelling them. Then we also made a decision to invest heavily in hybrids as well. Because to me, that's a great transition technology. 
and, and hybrids take lots of different forms. There's the hybrids that you're all familiar with, which basically just give you better gas mileage, and that's fine. We're doing that. We're also working on, you know, not working on, we're about to deliver plug-in hybrids, which um, to me is, it solves a lot of problems because if for most of your, virtually all of your daily driving, you'll be on all electric. But if you want to take a road trip to Chicago or St. Louis, fine. You just, you know, discharge the, the uh, battery and now you're on internal combustion. And so, um, because it was clear to me that this was going to happen in fits and starts, uh, Jim Farley and I had a lot of discussions about it. We, we agreed. So we've got something for everybody, because um, we don't know what the adoption curve will look like. Yeah. One thing, though, it, for sure is they are coming. People who have them, and this is interesting, the research all shows that people that have them don't want to go back. Uh, and, um, and they're growing, and they're growing quickly. But to your point, they're not growing as quickly as some of the early prognostications. Now, they are around the world. Um, the rest of the world, it, they're going really fast. Uh, Europe, it's, it's almost breathtaking how quickly it's happening. Mm -hmm. um, throughout Asia, <clears throat> China, of course, it's gone like that almost overnight. And so, you know, and we participate in all those markets. So we are developing EVs. We do think they, um, but you know, for some applications, it'll be a long time. Like you think of our super duty trucks. I mean, <clears throat> those things would require enormous batteries. Um, and, you know, and they still wouldn't have the tow towing capability that a lot of the Super duty uh, drivers would demand. So that'll probably be the last area of our fleet, and who knows what year that might happen. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so this will be a gradual thing. Um, we're not shoving anything down anybody's throat. Um, I mean, that's interesting, too. I never thought I would live to see the day where our vehicles had become political footballs. <laughs> um, and they are. So, you know, I was just in Washington last week, and frankly, if you're meeting with a Republican, it's the conversation goes, you know, why are you making these things? Because we just got energy independent as a country um, and China's got the lead. And so you guys are going to use Chinese technology. So why would we want to do it? If you go see a Democrat, it's why aren't you making more of them? Um, why can't we do more to, get, to accelerate this? And what do you need from us to accelerate it? Two very different conversations. Um, and, you know, and so the short answer is that's fine on both sides because yeah. we do have something for everybody. People, it's all about customer choice. And that's one thing I keep driving home in Washington is we shouldn't let Washington decide. Really, the customers will decide. And for some customers, the EV is a better equation, for sure, for sure. Yeah. And it will get better and better as, as the technology continues to get better and as the charging stations, which is a big issue for a lot of people, continue to get better and better. But until that time, um, we've got kind of anything you want. Yeah. Our very first breakfast club in this season was Energy Secretary Jennifer Granholm, who was out uh, singing the praises of EVs and talking about the stepped-up timetable that the Biden administration was talking up and encouraging. And, and since that time, it's been backpedaling, backpedaling, backpedaling here. Um, and I know Ford has been delaying some of its mm -hmm. EVs that it's doing as well. I'm imagining this must be hard to anticipate because, again, it's a political, well, politics and this presidential contest are smack dab in the middle of this conversation. Um, I don't know if you want to comment on that. Well, at no, all? I, do, I do want to comment on not necessarily on the candidates, which <laughs> that would be a fun conversation. Yeah. But, uh, no, but I, I think this, you know, our, our time frame as a company, our planning time frame is a lot longer than election cycles. So, you know, we can, we can do almost anything as a, com as a company and, frankly, as an industry, as long as we have some certainty towards where we're headed. The problem is when we're whipsawed back and forth by politicians, um, that becomes really difficult for us because we, we can't turn on a dime. You know, these things take, you know, several years to, well, you know, th three years to five years, depending upon the complexity of the program to plan for, and, um, and, and it's really beyond that because you're thinking about the technologies that you're investing in, which are a longer term thing. So the one thing that drives us crazy and that we really can't deal with is this back and forth, yes, no, you know, kind of thing. Just pick a path and we'll go for it. And um, so I, I do think that the political winds that are hurricanes that we're in now, they're not winds, um, that are just bashing everybody from pillar to post, um, we're trying to tune it out as best we can and just say, okay, 
what's the most logical path for us forward as a company? How do we hedge our bets? And I just mentioned that a minute ago, how we're hedging our bets. Yeah. Um, and, then, and then let the customer decide. Frankly, it's the only way we can kind of go through the madness that we're in. Yeah. When you're talking to leaders in Washington about this, people who are involved in, in uh, the energy department, and NHTSA, and other things here, <clears throat> and you're talking about the guidelines, the mileage, everything else here, do you think, because this is complicated stuff, and again, it's not something you can say, this is what we're going to do in six months, and boom, it's done. This goes on for years here. Right. Is there a sophistication of understanding of this? I, I would... Yes, but, yes, th these are smart people by and large, <laughs> not all of them, uh, but um, no, but they are, they are, and, and, you know, and they do get it, and they understand the nuance when you explain it to them. The problem is um, we're, in a, we're in a soundbite world, um, we're in a uh, headline world, and um, a lot of this stuff requires you know, nuance and explanation, and that, that's not very you know, attractive in the political world, right? Um, and the, they want to be able to walk out of that meeting and give a 10 second you know, encapsulation yeah. of everything you just spent 45 minutes outlining. Um, because we do, you know, with all our free, it's not just the US alone, that's the other thing. You know, we have all these free trade agreements with Canada, Mexico, mm -hmm. we, have free, we have trade agreements you know, around the world, we participate in different markets around the world. So it requires, you know, a patience on the other side, and then a, an ability to synthesize everything that w they were told, and then come up with policies that actually, you know, make sense. And I think as long as we're in an election cycle, and it seems like we're never out of one now, <laughs> um, that, you know, it just becomes harder. It yeah. really does. Yeah. Um, and, you know, nonetheless, for the good of the country, I mean, look, everybody understands in Washington that we need a strong industrial base. Um, we need an auto industry. They get that. There's no disagreement on anywhere on that. But from those fundamentals, you start to diverge quite quickly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you know, um, you know, we were the arsenal of democracy during two world wars. When COVID stepped up, we stepped. It, when COVID came at us. We stepped up before any other company, other in any other industry did. Um, there's an appreciation for that. But it always comes back to there in an election cycle. Yeah. Speaking of the pandemic, you remember you and I were in your plant in Ypsilant, in Rossonville. Yeah. When Donald Trump was president, yep. COVID was red hot. He came into the plant to tour and see what you're doing on the PPE front, walking through there. And I'll remember this. He wouldn't wear his mask or a shield. And so we were there talking. He was two hours late getting there, by the way, which... <laughs> was not a good thing. But then he walked over and gave me his mask, whatever, here. So when you get back to, that's a huge issue that you had to deal with. And, and has that endeared the auto industry, not just Ford, but the others, more to, to helping America as it did during the arsenal of democracy in World War II? Well, I find that politicians in particular have very short memories. And you need to remind them of this fact. Uh, you know, when we do, both, both Presidents Trump and Biden were actually very appreciative of what our industry and what our company did during COVID. Very appreciative, because no other industry could have done what we did. You know, we at Ford took a ventilator uh, that was developed by another company where they could make a few a month, and we turned into thousands a month, yeah. uh, because we know how to make a lot of things. And so, um, you know, and, I, and, and yes, there was an appreciation, and is, but as I say, it's kind of a what have you done for me lately world that we live in, and we have to keep reminding them of the fact of what we've meant to the country um, and what they would lose if they lost their industrial base. So as I say, there's really no disagreement among that, and both presidents were very complimentary and very grateful. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, we can't take for granted that they will always remember. Will this be, an, this, the conversion to EVs and what's going to happen timeline, will it make a difference who wins in November? I, I think there's so many bigger issues uh, in the public's mind that I, I don't think those will be the, the driving today. issues. I mean, I, you know, just look around everything we're dealing with as a country and as a world today. Um, I mean, I think maybe for some very small pockets, you know, policies like that will play a role. And obviously, we'll be paying an outsized uh, attention to that because uh, it'll affect us, you know, dramatically. 
but I don't, I don't believe that the average voter is going to have that on their top three list. Where do you see the growth coming for Ford over the next five years? Is it going to be the F-Series, the hybrids, the EVs? I mean, is there a magic combo? Can you plan that far out? Yeah, and we actually have growth. We are growing, um, and we're growing in all three phases, which is really fun. So we divided our company into three areas. We've, we've got the internal combustion engine business we called Ford Blue. We have uh, our EV, uh, EV business, Model E. Um, and then we have a third business uh, called Ford Pro, which um, is kind of our secret weapon. It's doing unbelievably well. We're the leader in commercial vehicle uh, all around the world, and whether it's vans or trucks. And so what we're doing, we realize that the uh, work customer is very different than the retail buyer. Um, and the needs of the work customer is very different than the retail buyer. And so we're developing all kinds of programs, software programs, but also uh, dealership programs to um, take care of those work customers in a way that's different than the retail buyer. And that's been a huge um, propellant for us as a company. So yeah, we, have, we actually have very aggressive growth plans. Um, but as I said a minute ago, and I won't keep hammering it, we also have flexibility. Well, now interestingly, Ford Pro goes both ways. It's both EV and it's internal combustion. Um, and so, uh, but you know, for the retail buyer, we can flex up or down depending. Um, but I do think hybrids is going to be something that's going to be very appealing to the average retail buyer. So for every ICE vehicle we're going to have, we'll have a sister hybrid uh, to go with it. To them. Interesting. So dual, dual paths you're taking there with it. Yep. So it's interesting. Your great grandfather, Henry Ford, uh, early on was looking at soybeans as a way to fuel cars, make cars. Mm -hmm. You and your whole career have been an environmentalist focusing on the climate and environment. Curious, how do you think we're doing as an industry and country at looking out for the planet right now? Well, look, I, you, we, look, you can always start to say we can do better, right? Yeah. But I think we've come such a long way. When I started with Ford, um, you know, my green views were, I was considered a radical whack job, uh, honestly. <laughs> um, and, um, but all I wanted to do was build, uh, b because back then, of course, you remember the, a lot of you won't remember, thankfully, because you're much younger, but the, um, you know, you had the environmental groups and you had industry and all they did was throw bombs at each other. There was no collaboration, there was no working together, and in fact, they didn't, nobody wanted to work together. And so I thought, well, this is ridiculous. We can't go on like this. I'm, I'm worried about the next 100 years of Ford Motor Company. And I was worried also about attracting the best and the brightest. I never wanted to be like the tobacco industry, where if we became so kind of stigmatized by society that the best and the brightest wouldn't want to come work for us. Um, and I could see what was happening on college campuses mm -hmm. and how the universities were teaching, you know, that we were the bad guys. And, you know, and, and, and the, the sad part for me was, you know, I grew up in an era where people wrote songs about our vehicles, right? Um, and, you know, they were sort of nothing but great things. And it was really only in the early 70s that things like pollution and, well, it wasn't even congestion back then. It was really just pollution that started to become an oil consumption, uh, a, a, a big deal. And so it really was very clear to me that that couldn't continue and that we couldn't uh, be on the wrong side of this issue, um, recognizing that we also weren't going to solve the issue, that we, but we had to be part of the solution and working towards it. We've come such a long way. I mean, you know, I remember 20 years ago we published our first um, environmental report, sustainability report, I guess we call it now, and uh, where we were self-critical. And I had a number of our executives saying, are you out of your mind? You're publishing something that we're actually criticizing ourselves? I said, it's the only way we're going to measure how we're doing. Uh, you know, so this is this year, and how do we do next year and the year after? Now everybody has those things, right? Yeah. Uh, and, um, and I think our industry has come a long way. It's now, now everything that we do is embedded in our business plan. It's not some sort of add-on that's off to the side. So I think our, and if you just look at our industry's metrics, um, you know, in terms of pollution and all of that, you know, we're chasing after the tiniest, tiniest little bit now. Um, and you could argue, and I think rightly, that there are many, many uh, more fertile grounds to go after uh, if you really want to make a, a fundamental change in CO2 and climate. But um, so I, I'm very, really proud of our industry and really proud of how far we've come, um, not just Ford, but the whole industry. So um, as I said, we could always, there's always something more to shoot for, and you know, everybody's making their carbon neutral. I'm always a little, look. 
again, we don't know, right? Um, we're, that's what we're shooting for. But I remember when, you know, self-driving, I remember a lot of our uh, co competitors around the globe were saying, we're going to have X number of self-driving cars on the road by 2018. And then I would go to an event, and they'd say, Ford, are you asleep? Um, and I'd say, but you know, the answer was no, but we knew how hard it was. And we couldn't figure out, how in the world are they going to have all these self-driving cars on the road? Well, guess what? Here we are today. Uh, and we're not very close to self-driving cars you know, in big numbers on the road. And there are always going to be test vehicles out there. Sure, we had them back then. Yeah. So I guess my point is that every, you know, anytime you make these you know, hard line in the sand prognostications, you just don't know. But you've got to work towards it. And that's what we're doing. Yeah. Well, I remember there was a commercial that another car maker, I won't say it out loud, had, it was from the 1950s, what the auto industry would look like in the 1970s, and it was autonomous vehicles, flying vehicles, and all that sort of thing. So now as we're sitting here in 2024, you look at autonomous vehicles. Do you still believe that your, well, your kids are grown, so they're already driving. Your grandkids <laughs> uh, are going to be driving still? Gosh, I hope so. Um, it's so much fun to drive. Uh, and, um, you know, I, I think if you, that's why, as long as I'm alive, we'll make Mustangs. Um, and, um, you, you know, it, uh, because I think the joy of driving is something real. Now, look, not for everybody. If you're in a city and you just want to get from point A to point B, there's no joy in that, right? Uh, you just want to get there and, you know, you get an Uber or a Lyft or whatever and you go. So, um, but I, I, I think, you know, autonomy will come, but it's going to come much slower. And, of course, it's going to come much more incrementally, too. So you, it already today, you look at what GM and ourselves and Stellantis and others have on the road. Already you're seeing elements of that creep into our vehicles, and there'll be more and more and more of that as, as the years go by. So that by the time you get to full autonomy, you know, frankly, people might, may not even notice um, because so much of that will have been baked in along the way. I think that's a much safer and much more logical way to introduce uh, this, as it turns out. Mm -hmm. And we, 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 look, we were guilty too. We thought we were going to go from you know, here to there in kind of one step. Um, and we realized along that journey that that probably wasn't the right way to go. Um, yeah. And so um, it, yes, it'll come probably in my lifetime. Um, but again, trying to, because <laughs> You can imagine, the trial lawyers are, are going to have a field day with these things. Um, you know, who owns them is another you know, issue. I mean, there's all kinds of issues attached to them um, that um, have to be solved before they're really ready for prime time. This is your 25th anniversary of being chair of the company. I'm curious, um, your guideposts in how you run the company. You mentioned the sustainability report, but just because what, particularly when you started, it maybe wasn't a lockstep with what earlier had been done. Well, look, to me, values are the most important thing a company can have. Uh, we're a family company. We have been for 120 years plus, um, and, um, and I hope we are for another 120 years. Part of that is, is the values you have as a company, and those values have to guide you. And I, I separate values from culture because cultures can change, uh, and values, though, shouldn't change. It's how we take care of our, each other, how we take care of the communities in which we operate, how we take care of our country. And, um, and so each generation will express those values differently because each generation is different. Um, but I think those really help guide us through thick and thin. And, you know, I, I was just thinking back the other day, you know, since I took over, um, we've been through eight what I would call crises uh, as a company. And along the way, you know, two of our competitors didn't make it. They went bankrupt. Um, we didn't. And I believe it's because our employees were willing to work day and night to save our, our, our company. Um, so, you know, I, I think that, you know, taking a long view, uh, planning not for the next quarter, not for even the next year, but kind of everything we've been talking about today, you know, how do we, how do we plan for the next 120 years in a way that, you know, my, my grandkids will have a stronger company than, uh, than, than we have today. And, you know, that, look, there's no crystal ball, right? And, you know, I've made so many mistakes along the way that, you know, you could write volumes about them. Um, but I think the important thing is that you, you learn from those mistakes uh, and that you keep your compass headed true north. Mm -hmm. 
You're a student of history. In fact, I think you officially were a history major, weren't mm -hmm. you? Mm -hmm. Okay, so that said, is there a leader from the past, could be a leader current, I guess, that you admire? Yeah, there are plenty of people I admire, of course. Uh, and I read biographies, that's sort of my thing. I mean, I've got a whole um, library full of biographies and I try and take something from every one of them. But one of the things I learned early on is to never pattern yourself after anybody else. I mean, completely. And I've seen so many people at Ford, frankly, make that mistake where we've had a successful leader. I've seen it in football, too. Um, where you have a you know successful head coach and they can be everything. I mean, you can have introverts, you can have extroverts, you can have people that are um, uh, firebrands, people that are ice cold. Um, but the one thing they all have in common is they're genuine, and people see that in them, um, and they don't see any phoniness because I think most people have great BS detectors. Um, and so as soon as you try and become something you're not. I think that's when you start to fail. And that's one thing I've, I've really learned from all these leaders, because they're all over the map in terms of personality types. And uh, I, you know, I just finished reading um, George H.W. Bush's um, biography. Really interesting, because you know, he was a one-term president. Um, and you can say, well, that wasn't great. But what really struck me was how he was doing it for the country. Um, he, was, he, was, um, he made decisions that weren't in his best interest but we're in the best interest of the country. And so, you know, to me, those are the kind of leaders that, that I admire. Even though I, you know, I didn't go into reading this book thinking that this was a hero of mine. But when I put it down, I thought, wow, I wish we had people around today like that, um, that were doing, you know, things for selfless and the right reason. I mean, he was a true servant of our country, you know, all the way from World War II all the way through. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Curious, as someone born and raised here, there is so much going on in the Motor City. I mean, with U of M, and, and, the, and I say Detroit, meaning the whole region. University of Michigan football team national championship, the Lions postseason play, Oakland University, Golden Grizzlies, where's the Oakland table? I know they're here. Where's Dr. Aura? I know, go, go, go. <laughs> we got the NFL draft going on next week. We got the Grand Prix coming up. The million dollar question is, okay, that's going to subside. How do we keep this enthusiasm and momentum going that we've got right now? Well, I think a lot of that that you just said is an expression of what people see in Detroit. Um, and, you know, it, it's, I mean, people around the country, and you all travel, you hear this. I mean, it's a very different conversation you have about our city than you had five, ten years ago. Um, and I love that because for most of my lifetime, for most of all of your lifetime, you know, it wasn't a great conversation. Um, you know, I, where are you from, Detroit? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, you know, um, or why haven't you left? Or you know, and on and on and on. It, it, none of that now. Um, and and if it is that, it's people that are completely asleep. Um, so I think that everything you just said really is an expression of how the the, the country now is viewing our city. And you know, when we when you know we just talked about the train station and that whole campus that's down there, when that's up and running, when the Hudson's building's up and running. I mean, we're, gonna, it, we're just adding to this now. Um, and uh, I, I think it's wonderful, and I expect more national and international events to come here, uh, and they will. Hence, perfect lead. Man, it's like you're reading my notes here of this. My next I'm trying to. I'm trying to figure <laughs> where you are. But. So my next question has to do with this. Um, the draft is next week. It's been 18 years since Detroit hosted a Super Bowl. If the draft goes well, we know Roger Goodell, the current commissioner, has been here a few times for that. The draft, presumably everything goes well. I know Claude Molinari and his team are doing yeoman's work. Claude, where are you? He left. Okay. No, there he is. Oh, <laughs> He's off doing yeoman's work there. Um, that there's so much going on, so much excitement about this. Also, in the same time, we've got a lot of hotels. The last time we did a breakfast club was with Denise Illich. Um, was part of it. We talked about bringing big sporting events to Detroit. It was 2019, and at that time they were talking about, well, I think we're going to try to make a bid to go after the draft. Well, they did, they got it. Hence, we're sitting here now. Bill Ford, the question, does Detroit have a legitimate chance to get a Super Bowl? Well, we did all those years ago, and I remember I, I uh, picked up the phone and I called Roger Penske. Uh, and I said, Roger, we, you know, we've got to go pitch this to the NFL. Um, and I can pitch it from the Lions side, but I need, I need you to come pitch this from the community side. Well, 
those of you who know Roger, and pretty much all of you do, know that um, A, he rarely says no to anything that, uh, I mean, he's incredible, and B, anything Roger touches is successful, anything. Uh, so he went in and just blew everyone away in the NFL with his pitch about Detroit and why, the, and remember, this was in an era where, you know, Detroit did not have the image uh, that, it, that it had today. Um, and the NFL, you know, kind of held its nose and said, all right, we'll come to Detroit. And they were expecting a terrible Super Bowl. And even today, the NFL people will tell you that it ranks in their top three, maybe their top one Super Bowl they've ever had. Uh, the city was amazing. Uh, and how everyone came together to host it and how friendly everybody was and how, and everybody that they encountered uh, was, was so excited to be the host. That stayed with the NFL. Having said that, it becomes more difficult for a northern uh, locale to host multiple Super Bowls. Part of the reason they did it was because we had built Ford Field, um, and they wanted to you know, showcase yeah. that. What, what we're up against now, um, and look, we're going to keep pitching for sure, and I hope we do get it. And I think, you know, is, is it impossible? Absolutely not. But it, it, it's difficult because with each new stadium being built, mm -hmm. they want to get into the rotation. Mm -hmm. As each new, you know, warm weather spot where people can, you know, package a vacation, you know, now with Vegas, of course, open and having just opened the Super Bowl, you know, it, it's a tougher sell for us. Uh, but we're going to keep pitching, and I keep reminding, you know, the experience that they had, all, you know, all those years ago. Yeah. It was great. Yeah. It'll be better this time, too, if they, if they come back. Because? Because we have more to do. Uh, we have better hotels, more hotels. Um, and we've now got experience in hosting the kind of events that you just reeled off. I mean, this the draft is going to be awesome uh, next weekend. We, we're we going to be flooded with out-of-towners um, coming to, to the draft. And so, um, you know, in the... The, the Grand Prix and I mean every every you know we we know how to host events in Detroit where all those years ago we were kind of rookies. Yeah, yeah. Um, the other thing that your family, your your great grandfather Henry Ford with Henry Ford Health System launched it, which is amazing to me that he launched this. And I see Bob Riney here in the front row. Um, Bob's launched, doing an incredible job, by the way. Well, as you know. Us, yeah, so in fact. Bob, I know you're doing so much with your development downtown. It's getting more approvals along the way. That's going to be, what, a $3 billion hospital system? $3 billion transformation. That whole area. And, and with Bob's background as a, as a penny watcher, any other city would be $5 billion. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's going to be amazing. And I know, again, bringing a calling card to Detroit as, as medical tourism destination type thing here. It's going to be much more to say about that. The other thing, too, I wanted to mention out here, Mike Bickers, who is the president of PNC here, doing tremendous things in the city with its $500 million Grow Up Great program, doing things out in Pontiac as well. And, again, someone else from Detroit who went to Detroit Public Schools giving back and helping give more young people here a chance to have greater experiences as well. I know this is a mission of yours as well. Yeah, I mean, part of what we're doing down at the train station um, is all about young people. So, I mean, that's because they're our future. And we want to provide, you know, Google's coming down and they're doing coding with young people um, down at the train station. You know, all the um, children's groups that we just talked about will have space in the train station. Um, we're going to have, you know, lots of internships available, uh, you know, with all our partners uh, down there. So, yeah, I mean, this... Everything we're doing, you know, that we are doing in Detroit um, as Ford certainly will benefit us today, but we, you know, if I just said a minute ago, I'm trying to plan for the next 120 years. Yeah. Part, look, if you don't have a healthy community, you can't have a healthy company, period. Um, and that's one of the things that, you know, has really driven me to want to give back. I mean, hey, I love this place that's where I'm from, it's where I'll be the rest of my life, but, um, Part of it is selfish. I want our company to succeed and thrive into the future, and we can only do that if we're in an amazing community where we're raising kids who stay here and don't leave um, and don't go to Chicago in you know huge groups. I mean, if you look at the, and you all know this, the number of graduates, particularly engineering graduates, who leave. You know, we educate them here and then they leave. We've got to stop that. Uh, and we've got to make, you know, A, have the jobs for them, and B, make this a place that they think is 
more fun and more interesting to be in than any place else they could go. And I know Oakland University and Lawrence Tech are here. We tell you most of their graduates stay here as well. So we've got schools here really doing yeoman's work here and, and all yeah, of that as well. And, and we, you know, we need that. And, and we need, you know, I mean, look, I'm preaching to the choir, but we've got more engineers in this state than any other state by a mile. We ought to be really, we ought to be a magnet for all this invention that's taking place around the country. This ought to be where it's happening. And, you know, and as I say, selfishly in my industry, it ought to be the mobility innovation that's taking place here. By the way, we have this test bed that nobody else has around the train station. So uh, uh, Mary, who's here, she secured not just the, uh, the road rights, but we have the air rights too. So we can, we, uh, the FAA's given us, the, so we can do drone testing, drones to vehicles, uh, whether that's delivery or search and rescue kind of things we can play around with down there. We have the first street now that's got inductive charging, which means you drive, uh, your, your car charges as you drive down the street. Um, we have a test bed that goes, it's called Michigan Ave, all the way from the train station all the way out to Ann Arbor. And it goes through every possible kind of uh, driving condition from heavy traffic and, and urban to suburban to almost rural, back to suburban, back into uh, or, you know, urban driving around mm -hmm. Ann Arbor. That's, we can test all kinds of stuff there. Um, and no other city, no, Silicon Valley doesn't have that. Um, and um, so, you know, when we look at the assets we have here, both physical and people, mm -hmm. we just got to put it together. Yeah. That's all. Yeah. I want to thank you, by the way. You bailed me out. Um, I kind of, I shouldn't say this, but George H.W. did in his book. I forgot to bring up Bob Riney and Mike Bickers to say a few words here on behalf of the presenting sponsors of this event. Perfect. They were going to say wonderful things about you, but... Oh, no, they we, yeah. don't. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Forgive me. We make mistakes once in a while. Anyways, anyways. Um, curious. So your daughter is here. She's on the board. I think she's the first female board member you've had, right? No, we've had female board, First family female. First family. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, and, and your son just joined the company not long ago. He did. And he's in the motor racing? He's in the performance uh, end. And then I, my youngest son is just graduating from business school, and we're hoping to lasso him, too. So, What advice do you give them about joining not just a, an interesting industry, but the family business? Well, one of the things I've said to the entire family is this is not a family employment agency. Um, <laughs> and um, <laughs> so... Um, you know, you've got to earn it, and you've got to show that you want to do it. And so I, I put some, some uh, guidelines in place. So to even, for, to even consider us saying yes to them working there, um, and this is true for our whole family, you have to work a minimum of five years somewhere else. Okay. Um, you have to have uh, uh, a really good undergraduate degree and a second degree in either engineering, business, or law. Um, and, um, and then you got to come see me um, because, um, and, and I think that, you know, it's, it's really as much for them as it is for the company. It's, you know, for the company, um, it, it, it ensures that we're not bringing the wrong people in. Um, and, you know, and because the, we have a family reputation to, to uphold. And also, but for them, it does two things. One is it allows them to get hard knocks early in their career somewhere else. Um, and if they do well, uh, it allows them to understand that they did it not because of their last name, but because of what they could accomplish. And then when they come to Ford um, with the academic degrees and with that experience, they, look, they can look around to their peer group and say, I belong here. Mm -hmm. um, and because failing that, I think they'd always wonder, well, am I, am I as good as this person that I'm working with, or am I just here because of my last name? So, you know, so it seemed kind of probably mean when I did this at the beginning, but I really believe strongly in it. And, um, and so the people that are coming into our company now in the family, you know, pass those tests with flying colors. Um, and so that's, I think it's, I think that's really important because it's the only way, having a family business is a great thing until it's not. Um, and the reason it's not could be, would be if we didn't have the right family leadership and strong family leadership. So mm -hmm. part of my job is to make sure that we do. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, I feel really 
great about that. I hope they love it. That's the other thing. They have to want it. I mean, look, everybody's got different interests in life. You know, my dad didn't give me much in, uh, advice, but the one piece of advice that he did give me, we were, I was just graduating from college. I was home for Christmas before graduation that year. We were playing pool in the basement. And uh, my dad said, well, what's next? And I said, well, you know, I've, I've done some interviews in New York, and you know, I've, I've gotten some job offers. Um, but you've never said anything to me about Ford. He said, you've never said anything to me about Ford. And I said, well, can I? Or should, and he goes, hey, hey, look, he said to me, you know, only if it is really what you're passionate about. Because he said, if you join and, and it's not what you're passionate about, you're not going to do yourself or the company any favors. Mm -hmm. So, um, and so, you know, and then we got, went back to playing pool and I joined the company. But, uh, <laughs> but no, but it was great advice. And I, I sort of therefore took stock every year. Is this really what I want to do? Um, and you know, here I am 45 years later, um, and the answer is still yes, but, but I think they have to go through that too. Through that too. Yeah. If you hadn't done autos, what else would you have done? Um, leaving football aside? Uh, <laughs> no, I, I, I don't know. Um, I mean, I, I probably would have done something in the venture capital space um, because to me, I, I love it, and that's why I founded Fontenelle's Partners. It, it, to me, it's so interesting. I mentioned earlier going out to Silicon Valley. The, 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 just the, the young people with brilliant ideas, to me, that's really fun and exciting. And, and, you know, and when they don't work, they just dust themselves off and keep going. And you know, I, I, there's great resilience in, in venture capital. There's, and so, and, and the young, there's such a sense of possibility there. Um, and the commitment that people have is 100%. They're not just punching the clock and going home. They're throwing their lives into it. And to me, that kind of passion was something that always resonated with me, and that's probably what I would have done. When you and I talked two years ago inside the Michigan Central Station, back when it went early evolution of the process here, and we talked about family, you talked then about Ford going forward and how much you're going to miss being part of this revolution that's going to continue here. What do you wish for the next generation, your, your daughter, your son, and possibly other son who will be part of that, and then their children, as far as what do you hope? Well, I hope they don't kick me out is the first thing. <laughs> um, but uh, So that would be my first hope. Um, but that day will come. And, um, and therefore, you know, I hope that they understand, and they will, the values that we have as a company. Um, and then, you know, and, and how... When I say it's a family company, it's not just our family, it's the entire Ford family. And we have so many multi-generational um, employees at the company. And you know, when we were in the darkest days of the uh, financial crisis, you know, I was getting flooded with letters and emails from employees saying, you know, and from the plant floor, don't give up, we can do this. Well, normally those are top-down messages, but they were coming to me you know, from people who cared as much about our company as I did. And so, um, you know, I think that is the power of having a family environment in a company where, it is, as I say, it's not just our family, it's them and their families and how they feel about the company. And so I, I hope the next generation never loses sight of that. Um, I don't think they will. Um, and then I also hope that they continue to push the envelope in terms of what's possible because part of my role has been, you know, to sort of color outside the lines and push management hard into areas that it's inconvenient for them to think about because they have day-to-day -day pressures. Um, so, you know, things like um, sustainability, the environment, um, you know, making investments in things like the train station, um, where it's not, you know, it, 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 through no ill will, but most management would say, look, you know, I've got four or five more years here, why do I want to do that? That, meaning whatever that is. Um, and so, but I, it's my job and, you know, to say this is exactly what we should be doing. We should be placing bets on the future. We should be making investments in our people and in our communities and in technology. Um, and I, so I hope the next generation embraces that too. You're being inducted into the Auto Hall of Fame in September along with five other luminaries. It's an extremely prestigious uh, honor and curious how you feel about that. I guess they ran out of candidates. Um, so, um, no, it's, it's, it's great. And, um, you know, I, I, but I, I kind of hate it, too, because it feels like the end. Um, you know, and I, I, don't, I don't like looking back. I like looking forward. Um, and so, I mean, it's, it's a great honor, and don't get me wrong, and, and I'm ha I really, it's going to be a fun event. 
but just part, it's the way I'm wired. I, I think so much more about tomorrow than I do about yesterday. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, when, when I was approached about it, I said, well, I'm not dead. Um, <laughs> you know, don't do this. Um, but um, so, you know, that, but I, I realize that's, that's my reaction. That's uh, but I think it's very cool. And uh, as I say, though, I I'm really look forward to tomorrow much more than, than yesterday. Great follow-up to my next question here, and that is this. We have the young people from Pershing High School here. They're looking at their futures. Um, do you have any advice for them or things they should think about, suggestion for them as they look to their careers and futures? Any advice you'd give them? Well, most advice is you know, what you pay for it, right? Um, so, and I think, but, but I would say this. Number one, um, something I said earlier, be, be yourself. Don't, don't try and pattern yourself. Now, it doesn't mean you can't try and be a better version of yourself. Uh, and everybody should try to be a better version of themselves and to work on things that you, know, you, you might not love about yourself. But at the end of the day, you've got to stay true to who you are and have people around you understand who you are. But I also think, um, in terms of you know, a career, pl first of all, plan your own. Don't let anybody else plan it for you. Uh, take a very active role in where you're going and what you want to do. Um, listen to people's advice, but in the end, you've got to do what you believe is right for you. Um, and you know, one, one piece of advice that I, I, I hear people say all the time, follow your passion. And sometimes that leads you to the wrong place. You have to follow your brain as well. Um, and they can't be disconnected. Um, you know, but if, you know, if, if my, passion, my passion is ice hockey, well, guess what? I'm not going to the NHL, right? Um, <laughs> and um, so, um, and so I, it, it, you know, to me, it's, it's both. You, you, know, you have to enjoy what you're doing and feel like you're, you're making a difference uh, to people around you and to, to the world. But you also have to use your brain and say, does this make sense? And can I succeed here? And what is my path to success here? Mm -hmm. um, and so it's, you know, I, I just hear too often, you know, follow your passion, follow your heart, blah, blah, blah. Yes, but. Uh, is, is that, uh, to me, that's a, something that I think people lose sight of, particularly when you're young, because, you know, you fall in love with things. And sometimes somebody, either you or someone close to you has to say, you know, that's great, but I'm not sure that's going to be a long-term success for you. Mm -hmm. um, and is there a way you can incorporate that into your life that may not be your, you know, your, what you end up doing with your life? We have in this room incredible influential leaders from across the region, across the state here, people who run big companies, smaller companies, who care deeply about Detroit, our region. They wouldn't be here on a Wednesday morning at 7 o'clock in the morning to, to hear that they want to hear what's ahead and so forth. As we wind this down, is there anything you would want to say to the collective body of folks here? Yes, thank you. Thank you for all you do for our region. Um, you know, it's, we are an amazing community. Um, you know, I, I hear this from other cities. They don't have what we have, which is a, people love our region. People are so committed to our region. Um, you know, when I travel to other cities, and you all do too, you know, they may have something they may have better weather, they may have the ocean, they may have, you know, but what they don't have are people like you who care deeply about our community and that work day and night to make it a better community. And I think that's our, really our secret weapon. Um, and, you know, it's, it's the people here that people love our region. They love Detroit. They love, they, and they want to do anything they can to make it better. And to me, um, you know, that's what gives me hope for the future for our, you know, our entire state of Michigan. And so I just want to say thank you to all of you because you, you're all the reason why we're moving forward so well. And I'm, I'm very excited for where, where you guys are taking us. Bill, I can't thank you enough for taking time to talk with us, share your insights, talk about our future and all the things that you're doing to help the city and the region here. You've raised the bar on Detroit, impacting future generations in so many different ways through your efforts. So uh, first off, quick applause for Bill for... And, and I want to thank also the sponsors, um, Bob Riney, Henry Ford Health, and Mike Bickers, PNC, and all the other sponsors in the room here. Truly, uh, your, your support 
is important and made this happen. We thank you as well for that. So without further ado, we're going to wind this down. We'll have an announcement about our next Breakfast Club sometime soon. So thank you all again. Safe travels as everyone heads out. Bill, any anything else to add? Nope. Thank you, Carol. That was all right. fun. Thank Great. You. Thank you.